Airports are some of the most visited and, at the same time, mysterious places out there. So, let's see what's going on behind the scenes and what secrets airports hide. At some airports, there are special people called profilers. Such people bring to life a special program called SPOT, Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They analyze your mimics, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice nonverbal signs of anxiety, people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in an unusual way, they can invite them for an inspection. There, they talk to this person trying to find out more about them and confirm or not their suspicions. Airport agents might also be watching you all the way from the security check to your gate. Some airports have facial recognition scanners that can easily track you. They're equipped with special software that compares passengers' faces with their IDs. Keep in mind that if you don't charge your laptop before the flight, it may be confiscated. It's not uncommon for an airport security officer to ask you to power your device up. If you fail to do it, your gadget can be taken away for an additional check. For safety reasons, it's crucial to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with or modified in a way that can cause harm during the flight. Packing an electric brush in your check-in luggage may land you in trouble. Brushes produced by some brands have lithium batteries inside, and those can potentially lead to serious problems in the air. That's why leaving your electric brush in your check suitcase isn't an option. But you're allowed to store them in your carry-on bag. At the same time, if your device runs on AA batteries, you can put it wherever you want. Anyone who's ever traveled by plane knows about the no liquids rule, but not everybody knows that this rule also applies to peanut butter, toothpaste, creams, lotions, liquid makeup, lava lamps, snow globes, some kinds of medications, deodorant, and even gel shoe inserts. Now, let's go outside for a while and look at those landing spots. Airports charge airline companies huge fees for landing on their runways on certain days and at particular times. But the most interesting thing is that the landing spots can be bought and sold. For example, in 2016, Oman Air paid Air France around $75 million for one early morning arrival slot at London Heathrow Airport. You must have noticed that airfare has increased over the past decade. That's because of the extremely high prices of landing slots. Dispatchers don't only control the planes in the sky, as you can often see in the movies, but they also look after their movements on the ground. They also control the lighting on the runways. There's three types of air traffic controllers, en route, terminal, and tower. Each of these dispatchers has their own area of responsibility. One dispatcher has about five monitors, and the information on them is constantly changing since the monitors show weather conditions and information about other planes. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to a security checkpoint, and all of a sudden, it turns out you have something prohibited in your carry-on. But worry not, you still have a chance to save your favorite pen knife. At some airports, there are on-site postal services, and you might have an opportunity to mail your belongings to any address you provide. But the mailing fees are pretty high. Plus, certain items are prohibited, and the postal service won't deliver them. Airports can be selling your lost luggage right now. Of course, I don't say that there's no chance for you to get back your suitcases that's traveled to a different destination, but just as likely, you might not see it again. In this case, an airport has the right to sell your misplaced belongings at an auction. Most airports have an annual lost luggage sale. After paying an entry fee, you can bid on electronics, clothes, bags, and other stuff. While flying, you might have a celebrity on board, but you won't know it. Large airports have separate check-in and security procedures for celebrities. They often board the plane directly through a hidden door located beside the jet bridge. Some airlines also use cool cars to transfer VIP passengers from the terminal building to the plane. At the same time, most people come to the airport well ahead of time. And the most popular activity while waiting for a flight is wandering through the duty-free zone. 
And even though people rarely plan to buy anything there, different products end up in their shopping baskets. That's because lots of airports are designed in a special way that makes people feel relaxed and at ease. I'm talking about all those huge windows, a lot of light, massage chairs, and comfortable seating areas. And statistically, calm passengers are 10% more likely to spend money on retail, duty-free, and food. Designers put a lot of thought into airport layouts. It helps to ensure the smooth flow of travelers. And the main point here is easy navigation that can prevent people from getting lost. This is achieved through subtle but very effective design cues. And placing duty-free zones between security checkpoints and boarding gates is one of them. They supposedly help you relax after clearing security and lead you where you need to go. But speaking of food, a celebrity chef restaurant at the airport might not be as good as it would be if you were visiting the real thing. Not chefs themselves, but special restaurant companies are responsible for airport outlets. One of the reasons is the extremely strict security that surrounds airport deliveries, including food. You may still have a nice meal, but it won't be the same. Now, I'll tell you about one more way airports manipulate you into spending your money. They make you walk through the shiny duty-free stores straight after the security check. But the most curious thing is that the walkway through such stores usually veers to the left. That's done because most people are right-handed, which means they use their right arm to pull their luggage and are more likely to look to the right while passing through the stores. And the duty-free zone veering to the left leaves more space on the right where passengers are more likely to look. Oh, and have you ever noticed how many mirrors there are at airports? Mirrors are strategically placed there to make airports appear larger and create an illusion of more space. This in turn helps to reduce the feeling of claustrophobia and makes the airport experience more comfortable for travelers. If you have an opportunity, don't exchange cash at the airport. You'll never get a good rate there. Those who didn't buy local currency in advance can instead order it online and collect it at the airport. Some services only need a few hours' notice for such an order, or it might even be better to use an ATM to withdraw some cash at your final destination. Now, have you ever paid attention to airport codes? The most often used are three-letter codes. Why this number? Back in the 1930s in the USA, pilots used the National Weather Service's two-letter city codes to refer to airports. But soon, the number of airports in the country outgrew the number of such codes. That's why airlines expanded this system by adding the third letter. It was usually X. That's how LA, Los Angeles, turned into LAX. But even though there shouldn't be two airports with the same code, some of these codes sound so similar you could easily mistake one for the other. For example, look at this airport with the code CGP in Bangladesh. And here we have CPG. It's the code of an airport in Argentina. It's dangerously easy to fly to the wrong place. So pay attention. Ah, yes, everyone loves a holiday. But figuring out what to pack in your luggage can be a daunting task, especially when you're limited on weight and baggage space. Not to mention you're likely to do some holiday shopping on your adventure away from home. So you're going to need extra space on your return for all those souvenirs you've collected. Accumulating too much weight or bulk can end up costing you a handsome fee with the airline if you're not properly prepared. But you can now relax. You just focus on booking your vacation. We'll take care of your luggage with these handy traveling tips. No doubt your clothes are going to take up the bulk of your luggage. Considering most airline standards permit one bag for most local trips and up to two bags for longer distances, that doesn't grant you a whole lot of space if you plan on being fashionable on your getaway especially in the winter. However, this doesn't mean you have to turn your undergarments inside out for repeated use. The key here is to be clever with how you pack. Firstly, you might want to consider how you're folding your clothes. The most space-efficient method to store your wardrobe in a suitcase for travel is to roll up each item. Think of your clothes like those sleeping bags you used to take on your camping trips. They always seem too thick for their compacted covers. But with perseverance, you could roll it up tight enough to fit inside. 
Now, you don't need to wrestle with your clothes quite as much, but the same principle here applies. Start by folding your shirts, pants, and whatever else you plan on packing neatly, similar to how you might find them on a clothing store shelf. Then, when you have them in a relatively rectangular or squared off shape, roll them up tightly. Now that you have your little clothes logs, start packing them into your bag. And behold, extra space! Now, here's something we've all experienced arriving at our holiday destination. We drop our suitcase on the hotel bed, open it up, only to find all our clothes unfurled and scattered like a tornado stormed through our bag. Your luggage has had a rough journey from your home to your holiday destination. It's been dragged through airport terminals, tossed around by baggage handlers, and rocked back and forth during in-flight turbulence. A simple stationary item, rubber bands, will help you keep your clothes neat. Now that you've got them rolled up, place a couple of rubber bands around them to keep them from unfurling. This is an especially neat trick if you want to roll an outfit together as one. Maybe you've got head-to-toe denim that you can't wait to rock on your getaway. Fold up your clothes as before, then layer the different items of your ideal outfit atop each other. Roll them up as one, then use the rubber bands to keep them together. You can preemptively decide your day-to-day -day outfits before you even board the plane. However, you may still prefer to fold your clothes, especially business or formal shirts and pants. Lucky for you, we have a handy trick for that, too. Instead of folding each item individually, we're going to lay it out all on top of each other. Start with your shirts and tops, alternating with one on top and one on the bottom, keeping the necks of your shirts at the center. Work your way down to your pants and smaller items until they're all laid out flat. Try to keep your pants in the middle. Finally, start folding your items in on themselves, with the shirts creating the outer layer until you end up with a neat bundle, like a present. You should be able to sit your bundle squarely into your bag. Want to save even more luggage space? Instead of putting your undergarments and socks into their own section, try fitting them into available spaces and gaps within the rest of your luggage. If you plan on taking a cap with you, for instance, the inside of your headwear is a great space to store your socks. This applies to other small luggage items too, such as phone chargers and ties. Though keep in mind that you can also lay your ties and belts out flat across the clothes in your luggage to conserve space. And if you're really limited on baggage size, say all you have is a carry-on for a fortnight long trip, here's another method. Get yourself some compression bags to store your clothes in. These bags will compact multiple sets of clothes into the size of a small laptop bag. Fold up the clothes you intend to pack and store them into the compression bag. You should be able to fit 8 to 10 standard clothes items or a few bulky ones. Once you've filled the bag, seal it and squeeze the air out through the built-in one-way pressure valve. The easiest way to do this is either by rolling it, and you should be pretty good at rolling your clothes by now, or by using your knees to apply pressure. You should be able to fit two to four of these compression bags in your standard carry-on suitcase, which is especially helpful if you want to save money by avoiding checked-in luggage. And you can take even more clothes on board with you if you stick them into a pillowcase. The best thing about this tip is that it also doubles as a comfy pillow for you to rest your head on during the flight. If you do have a bit more space to spare, another great way to keep your stuff organized is with packing cubes. It might not be as space efficient as compression bags, but a lot of travelers prefer them for tidier and well-organized packing. You might like to divide them by outfits or clothes types, such as one for pants and one for tops. You can easily purchase packing cubes from most online retail services and travel and camping stores. There are also packing cubes specially designed for one or more pairs of shoes. This is a great way to compact the space your shoes would otherwise take up in your luggage and to keep your clean clothes from coming into contact with your footwear. Nobody wants their tops to smell like feet, right? If you're still struggling to bring all your items with you inside your suitcase, there are a couple more tricks that you can use for that extra bit of weight without the extra cost. The most obvious of which is to use your own body. <laughs> That's right, time to layer up. 
Pick out all your bulky items and wear as many as you can manage. You can try wearing some shorts under your pants or several layers of your winter wear, such as your sweater, jacket, and coat, all over the top of one another. You might be sweating a little, but most airports and planes are well air conditioned. You can always shed some layers once you've boarded your flight. At least you'll have some warm wear to snuggle up in if you do get cold up there in the clouds. If you don't want to wear all those layers, there's actually another type of bag you can carry on the plane with you, free of charge. Get yourself a duty free bag from any of the duty free stores in the airport. You can even hang on to it for next time. Store all your extra items in your duty free bag and carry it onto your flight at no additional cost. It's also worth considering what type of luggage you're using. More importantly, how much it weighs. A lot of people forget that the standard 15 pounds permitted by most airlines includes the actual weight of their suitcase. The bag itself can often weigh up to 4 to 6 pounds. That's a huge chunk of your weight in the bag alone. So, when you're shopping for your luggage, take into account how much it weighs. Choosing a lighter bag will give you more space for the items you want to take with you. Stick to some of these handy tips and you'll be on your way with no shortage of luggage and some extra money to spend on your vacation. Happy flying! Oh, you're dining in Paris with a full belly of French onion soup and a mouthful of double chocolate souffle. <laughs> okay, enough of that bad accent. The waiter approaches asking how your meal was and mouthful, you give a satisfied expression and make the A-OK -okay gesture. You expect to see happiness on the waiter's face, but he looks at you with irritation. Well, it turns out that making a circle with your index finger and thumb does not mean okay in certain countries. In France, it means zero or worthless. Instead of praising the delicious food, you called it worthless. Oops. In Venezuela, Turkey, and Brazil, it's a hand gesture you shouldn't use either. In these countries, this is a sign that will offend pretty much anyone you flash it at. Enough said. Just give them your biggest smile and wait till you finish what's in your mouth to give your proper thanks. All over the world, giving a thumbs up is seen as a positive thing. It's an expression of your liking towards something that everything is good. In parts of Italy, West Africa, Iran, and Greece, though, it carries a stigma as an incredibly offensive gesture. When visiting Malaysia, you use this digit to point at things. So next time you're trying to hitchhike in these countries, you should reconsider sticking your thumb out for a ride. You might never get picked up. Trying to order two of anything or showing someone the peace sign in the UK, Australia, or New Zealand is fine, as long as you don't have your hand the wrong way. Do this gesture wrong and you're giving a very offensive hand signal, which isn't going to win you many friends. So, make sure that when you have your index and middle fingers pointed up in the V-shape, your palm is facing outwards, and you'll have a great time, mate! Bowing is used a lot in East Asian cultures to greet each other and guests. The deeper the bow is, the more respect you are being given. Fortunately, most Japanese don't expect foreigners to understand the bowing etiquette right away. They'll generally also accept a handshake or a nod. But being familiar and practicing your bowing etiquette before going to Japan will impress all the locals. How low can you go? Using your index fingers is considered impolite in several European, Latin American, and African nations. It's particularly rude in China, Japan, and Indonesia when pointing at a person. The gesture might be taking as you singling someone out to blame or insult them. If you ask for directions in the Philippines, you might be left scratching your head, wondering where they're pointing. Don't be alarmed. The locals use their lips instead of raising their hands. When in doubt, wherever you are in the world, just gesture toward a person or place using your entire hand. You might think that sticking your pinky finger out makes you look fancy. But in China, it's frowned upon. This gesture is the same as giving a thumbs down and meaning that something is making you unhappy. When taking photos with others, you want to be respectful and don't want to make any obscene hand gestures. Two gestures to avoid, in particular, are sticking up only your pinky finger and pointing at something with a dirty object, like a used fork or a chopstick. Now, it's fun to eat with chopsticks, but you might accidentally cause offense if you put them down the wrong way. 
When you're in China, South Korea, or Japan, don't make the mistake of sticking your chopsticks upright in a bowl of rice. This is considered bad luck. Oops. If you have to put your chopsticks down, simply place them on the side or across the bowl instead. Likewise, when eating in South Korea or China, don't ask someone to pass you some food. In these countries, you have to join in the action and grab what food you desire. And you're not going to offend anyone if you take that last bite, either. In some places, it's acceptable to blow your nose while at the dinner table. Not all of us are even prepared for the sudden trickle of the nose. But as long as you excuse yourself and turn away, everything is okay. Except if you're vacationing in Japan, China, or South Korea, where the chilies can make your nose runny very quickly. So never blow your nose in public. If you must clear your nostrils, consider leaving the table and blowing your nose in the restroom or hiding away from any other observers while being quiet. It's considered rude and unhygienic to the people around you. Always use a paper tissue, not a handkerchief, and throw it away after use. Fiji is one of the top destinations in the world. Beautiful beaches and friendly people. Spending your vacation on this island, you're bound to meet a few local Fijians that'll want to shake your hand for a very long time. It's customary to hold your hand for the entire time that you're exchanging greetings, no matter how long. You should also make sure not to pull away too quickly. It's considered very rude if you end the handshake abruptly. If you are in India, you put your hands together instead of shaking a person's hand. Holding your hands in a prayer formation Tilt your head down slightly and greet the person with namaste, with your hands close to your chest. Crossing your arms means nothing in most countries. Maybe you're cold, bored, or it just feels more comfortable. In Finland, though, it's likely to send the wrong kind of message. Having your arms crossed means major disrespect. Finnish people see this as a sign of arrogance and defiance. It's done mainly to tell the people around you that you're looking for trouble. Yikes. This body language will be taken as a dare, so you're likely to be confronted if you do it. Specifically, avoid crossing your arms at people directly. You don't want to cause any trouble if you're over there on holiday. It might be tempting to shake hands with a person as soon as you meet them in Russia. But if it's in a doorway, forget about it! It's not the end of the world if you forget this simple rule. But some Russian people consider it to be very unlucky. Step all the way through the doorway before you extend your hand for a handshake. This goes for restaurants, homes, shops, and just about anywhere else you can think of with a doorway. Avoid this simple mistake and you'll save yourself some trouble and bad luck. The head is the most sacred part of the body in Thailand, so patting anyone on the head can be seen as a serious offense. In the United States, Patting or ruffling someone's hair is meant to be playful, or even an indication that someone's done a good job. But in Thailand, it's best to keep your hands away from other people's heads to avoid disrespecting or making them feel unclean. It's also wise to not point with your toes as feet are considered the dirtiest part of the body. While on holiday, the last thing you want to be doing is insulting people. Looking at your watch in the middle of a conversation can be considered extremely rude in the Middle East. It looks like you're in a hurry to get away from the person you're talking to. Even if you've got an appointment for something, you don't want to be rude. Let the conversation run its natural course before checking the time. In Arabic culture, once communication has started, it must take its time. (laughs) Get it? Don't ever use the palm out, fingers up, stop gesture in Greece. You might not like the outcome if you do this to a local. This gesture is a huge insult to Greeks, a stigma that dates back to the Byzantine times. Likewise, in South Korea, don't hail a cab or wave someone over to you with your palm facing up. If you do, you might be stuck there for hours. Waving your hand like that is how Koreans summon their dogs. The proper way to wave is to stick your arm out while having your palm facing down and moving your head up and down vertically. This isn't the only thing to keep in mind in South Korea. If someone older than you offers a drink, the proper etiquette is to receive it with both hands and then turn your head away as you take the first sip. It's a show of respect, 
and respecting one's elders is taken very seriously in South Korea. Let me continue my world tour, and now we're heading straight to Europe. Let's start our journey in Greece, a place with thousands of years of history. Even in modern days, there are still ancient ruins there that are being carefully preserved, and it's an interesting ride. The airport of Athens has a built-in museum with ancient artifacts. And here's how ancient and modern coexist there. Here's the view of the Acropolis from the street. A Spartan roaming the streets of Greece. A Redditor shared a photo of a modern building built right over the ancient ruins. The visitors can see the ruins through the glass. Greece is also very well known for its cats roaming the streets everywhere. This Redditor spotted a cat guarding the National Bank of Greece. These days, everyone is trying to reduce the usage of plastic. Some use paper straws and some go with glass straws. But this cafe in Greece offered to use macaroni as straws. I'm not sure if it's stupid or genius. Another user went to a restaurant in North Macedonia and got baffled when they served slices of pizza on waffles. Double win, a snack and no waste. In Romania, vending machines seem to be a thing. This one, for example, is a machine with ham. And here's a better one, a vending machine selling cartons of eggs. Scrambled eggs, probably. Europe is a place where old neighbors are modern. And this combination is mesmerizing. I'll show you. This Redditor shared a photo of a modern basketball court squeezed between 700-year-old walls in Croatia. And here's a photo from inside a grocery store. Look at these old columns. Modern problems require modern solutions. These traffic lights light up the ground so that people who store their phones could notice when the light changes. Italy is a work of art with thousands of years of history. I have quite a bunch of stuff for you from there. Some ruins date back thousands of years, and a lot of that gets preserved. A Redditor shared a photo of a lobby of a hotel that has a glass floor so that the ruins were visible. And these are the railing in an Airbnb. Even street signs are a work of art in Italy. Look at this one. Another Redditor shared even more designs. This Redditor showed a photo of a supermarket that is located in an old theater in Venice. Another user added one more photo of that supermarket. Since we're talking about supermarkets, apparently, pets are allowed there. There are even special carts to carry them. Cities are centuries old, and there are quite a few narrow streets, so post vehicles have to adjust to fit them. Here's one of them. Some cities have canals or are located on islands, so boats are a thing. This is a UPS boat at Murano Island. Europe is packed with countries. The city of Basel in Switzerland is located right on the border with France and Germany. So the airport has three exits. You can walk out of it to France, Germany, or Switzerland. Let's walk out in Germany. Look, there's a traffic light with a girl walking a camel. The reasons are a mystery to me because camels aren't really a German thing, but it's cute. Here's another unique streetlight featuring Karl Marx, a famous German philosopher. Back to baffling vending machines. In Germany, you can find vending machines with sausages. Hamburg is Germany's major port city. There's a river that connects it to the North Sea. No wonder there's a drive through McDonald's for a boat. Look at this design of mineral water that is being sold in the Swiss Alps. A Redditor brought a souvenir from France. These are baguette-shaped pens. Look at this narrow house in Spain. I wonder what it looks like inside, but unfortunately, the Redditor only shared the exterior. In Portugal, cell phone towers are disguised as trees. And this is a bus that can ride the roads and then turn into a boat. A Redditor spotted doors in London that have doorknobs in the center. This seems super inconvenient, but apparently the handle doesn't turn and exists only to pull the door closed. And the metal part with the keyhole has a little handle on the bottom of it. Europe is a historical place. This post box bears the mark of a king ruling over a century ago. Back in the day, red telephone boxes were in high demand. Nowadays, when every person has a cell phone or two, not so much. 
so telephone boxes are being used in different ways. This one, for example, is now a smartphone repair shop. Luxembourg is a small but rich country squeezed between France, Germany, and Belgium, and they have baguette vending machines. Let's move north first to the Netherlands. Farmers border their fields with a strip of flowers and put up a sign with a QR code where people can pay for picking the flowers. And here's just a weird installation spotted by some Redditor. In Denmark, in Aarhus, a city founded by the Vikings in the 8th century, you can find traffic lights with Vikings pictured on them. Some trash cans in Swedish subways have a separate space for cans. Homeless people can pick them up and exchange the cans for some cash. There's a giant statue of a silver moose in Norway. And these are signs on bathroom stalls depicting reindeer. Apparently, Finnish people are as polite as Canadians. On the bus, they have a button to thank the bus driver. Also, a Redditor spotted a raccoon pattern on a bus seat. We all know rocking horses. Most of you probably had one in your early days. Well, Finnish little people have rocking moose. Many people come to Iceland hoping to see the northern lights. A Redditor had a phone in the hotel which had a special button to wake the guest up when the northern lights appear. Lithuanians sometimes put fake police cars on the sides of the road to combat road speeding. Europe has been ruled by kings and queens for centuries. Even today, many countries like the UK, the Netherlands, Spain, Denmark, Belgium, and some other countries have monarchs. So, no wonder that there are hundreds of castles scattered across Europe. Poland doesn't have any monarchs these days, but it still has 500 castles. Here's a warning sign for ghosts next to one of them. In Wrocław, all landmarks have a model so that visually impaired people could touch and see them too. There's also a statue of Darth Vader in one Polish city. In reality, it's a statue of a Polish magnate who supervised the construction of a port. But from time to time, locals dress the statue in Lord Vader's costume. This sign in Poland specifically prohibits bikes, tractors, and horses to go on a highway. In some places, there's a separate line on the sidewalk for people who are walking and staring at their phones. And now, we travel across the Atlantic to Africa. This is Dune 7 in Namibia the seventh biggest dune in the world. It's as tall as the Empire State Building. An internet user shared this photo. Someone in Tanzania put a literal penthouse on top of the building. I did some research and found out that it's a hotel. Still doesn't explain the roof, but I'm totally buying it. Maybe it's marketing. It's your first trip to Egypt, and your new friends there invited you for lunch. The food seems a bit dull, so you decide to spice it up with salt and pepper. You don't see it on the table, so you ask the host for it, and you notice everyone's shocked. It turns out, it's a huge insult to the cook when someone wants to change the original taste of the food on their plate. The cook made it that way for a reason, and wanting to spice it up means showing that the dish wasn't good enough. You're used to doing it as a kind gesture around the world, but don't tip waiters, taxi drivers, or hotel workers in Japan. They can get offended because they already get paid for providing you with good service, and there's no need for extra money to make it any better. If you really want to show appreciation, just say thank you. It's okay to tip private guides, tour companies, and interpreters. You can put any amount that feels right to you in an envelope and hand it down to them. If you want to impress your new Japanese friends or colleagues, take some time to study chopstick etiquette. When you master the art of holding chopsticks, remember not to rub them together. People do it to remove splinters, so it might look like you're unhappy with the quality of the pair that your host provided you with. Don't put your chopsticks vertically in your bowl of rice. This way, it can be seen as an offering to the deceased. Don't wave chopsticks in the air or use them to point at things. Both are considered really rude. The same is with moving things with your chopsticks or the hand holding them. It looks disrespectful. Plus, you're likely to spill things. When in Italy, 
don't order a cappuccino afternoon. The locals don't do it because they believe the milk and foam turn this drink into a meal and it's not good for digestion. Also, be prepared to enjoy your coffee standing at the bar and pay for it before you even order it. First, you pay the cash register, then show the receipt to the server to get your drink. Are you a big fan of chewing gum? Well, you'll have an uneasy time in Singapore. Using, selling, and importing chewing gum is banned there, and you'd have to pay up to several thousands of dollars for doing it. This law was introduced in the 1990s to make the city cleaner and keep the local fast trains up to schedule. When they launched a new transit system, passengers stuck gum onto train door sensors, causing some serious delays. With the new rules, this problem was solved. The no gum policy, along with many other strict rules, did help to make Singapore a really clean and fine city. Pun intended. If you absolutely can't imagine your life without chewing, the local authorities recommend replacing the gum with bananas. When someone asks you to pass them something, like salt at the table in Bolivia, don't give it directly to them. Hand it to the person sitting next to them and they'll pass it for you. If the person next to you is asking for that little favor, you still can't hand it straight to them. The person next to you will have to help. This table etiquette comes from a superstition that handing something to someone directly into their hands brings bad luck. For the same reasons, you can't reach across the table or stand up to pass something or toss it to someone. And don't forget to keep both hands on the table when you aren't eating. It might look like you're trying to hide something if your hands aren't visible at all times. When you arrive for a meal in Jordan, the hosts may give you some bitter Arabic coffee as a warm welcome. Don't try to stretch it for the rest of the evening. The polite thing to do is empty it fast. Only when everyone's done with the drink do people go back to socializing. As you pass the empty cup to the hosts, make sure to jiggle your wrists. If you just pass it without jiggling, it will mean you're asking for a refill. Don't rush to arrive at an event on time in Venezuela. People might think that you're rude or greedy. The polite thing to do is to be 10 to 15 minutes late. Events scheduled for 7 o'clock will often begin at 8 o'clock or later. A popular story goes that in the 1980s, a foreign reporter arrived at a press event more than an hour late. When he saw the room was mostly empty, he went to apologize to the host for missing the event. The host then told him he was the first reporter to arrive. It's quite interesting because the clocks in this country have officially been 0.9 seconds ahead of the rest of the world for years. Are you planning to travel by bus in Ireland anytime soon? Don't forget to thank the driver for the ride on your way out of the bus. You'll hear an overwhelming majority of locals do it loudly as it's basically not optional. Choose the gift wisely if you've been invited to a home in Vietnam. It's okay to bring fruit, sweets, or incense. Handkerchiefs are believed to be a symbol of a sad farewell, and cutting tools are a sign of cutting relationships. So don't bring those. Wrap your gift in colorful paper and don't opt for black. The locals believe this color to be a bad omen. When you present the gift, hold it with both hands. And don't be surprised if the hosts don't open it right away. It's done after the giver has left. Don't leave anything on your plate in India. It's a sign of disrespect for the food you were served. Food is considered sacred in the country, so it would upset your hosts a lot. So, wash and dry your hands before starting the meal. Don't forget to praise the cook and wait for the eldest to stand up before you leave the table. In South India, it's common to serve food on a banana leaf. You gotta fold it over from the top when you're done with the meal. Folding it from the bottom means you weren't satisfied with what you got. It might be a good conversation starter elsewhere, but don't brag about your achievements in Denmark. The locals believe that everyone is equal, so you won't hear them talk about their successful careers or talents or how special they are. And they expect the same from you. If you're looking for a good topic, they'll gladly talk to you about the greatness of their country. The Danes are really proud of it and all its wonders. If you're going on a trip to Germany and plan to drive on the famous Autobahn, make sure to tank up before you hit the road. 
Stopping, parking, making U-turns, and backing up on this super speedy highway is illegal. Yes, even if you have to stop because you've run out of gas, you'll have to pay a fine since you were supposed to plan things better. And although the Autobahn technically doesn't have a speed limit, watch out if you're passing by urban areas like Frankfurt, Berlin, and Munich, or construction works and heavy traffic. There will be special speed instructions for these spots. In case you're planning to explore Cyprus by car, quench your thirst before you start the vehicle. Drinking anything, including water, isn't allowed while driving on the island. So if you can't resist snacking or drinking behind the wheel, prepare to pay a fine. In Ethiopia, you gotta think twice before choosing a gift for someone. They see it as a debt they'll have to repay in the future. So if you bring something really expensive, the receiver will either have to spend a lot of money on a return gift or feel indebted to you. Now, flying has long become routine for many people. But even frequent flyers sometimes don't know about things you should never do on a plane. Ooh. No bare feet on a plane. It's one of the biggest no-nos of air travel. Even if we omit the topic of unpleasant odors. Phew. The airplane floor is extremely filthy. People with contagious foot problems might have been walking the aisles barefoot before you. There's likely to be a lot of dirt left after previous passengers. And don't even get me started on the floor in the laboratories. Ew. If your feet need some freedom, take off your shoes, but at least wear your socks. Or bring along a pair of light slippers. Keep in mind that the pressurized air in the passenger cabin is just as dry as it is in the Sahara Desert, with only about 20% humidity. That's why your skin may feel discomfort after a flight. Mm. But wouldn't it make more sense to install several humidifiers that could add some moisture? But this extra load would cost airlines lots of money. Plus, the plane's airframe is mostly made of aluminum and other metals, and humid air could lead to corrosion. So, don't forget to bring a moisturizer and use it during the flight. Always secure your tray table as soon as the plane starts moving on the tarmac, and never lower it during the takeoff and landing. It's a security measure, which ensures that you and the other passengers will have a clear pathway in case of an emergency evacuation. Also, keep your seat in an upright position during takeoff and landing. First of all, a reclined seat can seriously slow down an emergency evacuation, since it will block a person sitting behind. What's more, the more backward you're leaning, the harder it is to get into the brace position during an emergency landing. Now try to avoid snoozing during or right after takeoff and landing. For one thing, it's not the best thing for your health. The main problem is that the air pressure inside the cabin changes very quickly during these phases of the flight. This, in turn, affects the air pressure in your ears. It's important to be alert during this time to relax and open up your ears. For example, by yawning or swallowing frequency. Chewing gum works for me. If you're sleeping, you can't do this, which can lead to permanent damage. And of course, there's a safety issue. Most accidents happen during takeoff and landing. If you're sleeping during these stages, you might not be alert and conscious enough if an emergency happens. Now, this next recommendation comes from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. According to them, you might want to skip on hot drinks on a plane. The water used to make tea or coffee doesn't come from bottles. It's regular tap water. And water tanks on airplanes are often old and full of bacteria. In 2004, there was a study which found that more than 12% of water samples contained harmful bacteria. But if you still decide to have a cup of hot beverage on a plane, never pour coffee or tea on your own. Flight attendants are trained to handle this task in crowded aisles of a moving airplane and won't accidentally burn you or other passengers. Now, it's probably better if you don't order Coke on a plane. The cabin pressure so low up in the air causes a lot of foam. For apparent reasons, flight attendants don't want to serve you a cup filled with froth. That's why they'll fill only half the cup, then wait for the bubbles to settle, and then finish pouring. That can take ages. Keep your air vent open. This way, you'll minimize the spread of germs. Planes have high-quality air filters. They'll catch up to 99% of all airborne germs, so you should be safe there. But make sure to wipe that tray table. 
with 8 times more bacteria than the toilet flush button. It's the dirtiest place on board. Another thing you should avoid is leaning your head on the window if you have a window seat. You never know who occupied your seat before you, and in any case, the glass is likely to be covered with germs. Say no to backless sandals and high heels on a flight. I do. There are very serious safety reasons for such a request. The first is that both these types of footwear make it very difficult to evacuate the aircraft fast. If you wear high heels, you will anyway have to leave them behind in case the crew is using emergency slides during an evacuation. The heels are very likely to damage the slide, so off they go. Now ask yourself, do you really fancy running away from the airplane barefoot? I'll answer that for you, nope. Instead, wear sturdy shoes with a solid sole. In this case, you won't find yourself standing on the hot tarmac or in the weeds without any footwear at all. Don't stuff heavy objects into overhead compartments. Your things may not stay inside during severe turbulence. Then, while falling out, they will injure you and other passengers. Ow! That's why, if it feels difficult to lift something into the overhead compartment, better put it under the seat in front of you or elsewhere. Now, don't blame the pilot for the hard landing. When you experience it in bad weather, it might be intentional. If the runway is covered with water or snow, the plane has to touch down hard in order to break the water layer and prevent aquaplaning. Otherwise, the water can perform the role of a lubricant, and the plane won't be able to break or respond to any control. Deploying an emergency slide when there's no emergency is a bad, very bad idea. It can cause hour-long delays and cost airlines thousands of dollars to pack the undamaged slide back into its container. Why would someone do it? Apparently, some think it'll help them get off the plane faster. Well, they're an idiot. Don't be one yourself. Just keep in mind that it doesn't work this way. Don't ignore the instructions of the cabin crew to open window shades during takeoff and landing. This way, flight attendants can see what's happening outside, assess the situation, and act fast, organizing the evacuation. For example, if there's a fire outside one exit, they will redirect passengers toward another door. Avoid carrying spray deodorants or shaving cream in your carry-on baggage. Both these things tend to explode mid-flight and, therefore, aren't allowed on board the airplane. A much better idea is to choose stick deodorants. You also mustn't keep power banks in your checked luggage. And if you want to bring one on board, its capacity shouldn't be more than 20,000 milliamps. Besides, you shouldn't use them during the flight since they might catch fire. In general, lithium batteries are safe to use. But since they're high energy, they can catch fire if they're not treated with care, misused, or if there's a manufacturing fault. Such batteries have been the cause of quite a few fires on board airplanes, as well as during ground handling. Do not worry about airport scanners. They won't harm your health. Otherwise, airport employees wouldn't be able to stay near them without special clothing. Even when you're passing by a baggage scanner, the risk is minimal. And the last one. Don't act like a jerk on board. Behave yourself. I know you will. Also, never try to land a plane on your own. Nah, don't laugh. I'm not kidding. In movies, they often show us that something happens to the pilots and they can't land the plane. And that's when the main character, a very skillful person, starts their game. Unfortunately, it's close to impossible to do it in real life. Even if a person is a genius, is fond of computer simulators that match the real model of an aircraft 100%, and is ready to follow all the instructions from the ground, they're likely to fail due to one simple aspect – stress. It is true that there have been cases throughout history when amateurs landed smallish private planes after the incapacitation of a pilot. However, there has never been a case of a non-professional pilot landing a commercial passenger airplane. It's only in the movies. Hotels are places where you know for sure lots of people stay every day. And not all of those places pay attention to cleanliness as much as they should. There can be bed bugs and other pests around that you won't notice until it's too late. So here's the deal. When you arrive at a hotel and open your room, don't rush to open your bags and put all your clothes onto the shelves, and especially the bed. Better place your bags into the bathtub for the time being, and go check the room for those pesky bugs. Check out all the rugs, soft furniture, cushions, and all other places that pests could live in. Only after you've done that, 
take your bags out of the bathtub and unpack. The bathtub is the safest place because no bugs are able to survive there. So naturally, none of them will crawl into your stuff while you're not looking. You may want to throw that comforter on the floor at once, by the way. While sheets may be cleaned regularly, the comforters are not. Some hotels wash them every week or so, but others don't even bother. Same goes for your bedding. Most high-end hotels will change the sheets daily, but a lot of budget ones don't change the pillows or bedding after a guest checks out. Definitely a good idea to request fresh pillowcases when you arrive. It's also best not to drink out of that glass in the bathroom, as many glasses aren't cleaned properly. Some workers even use disinfectant or furniture polish to get the glasses looking spotless. Ever wondered why they never use fitted sheets in hotels? They might be convenient, but they're impractical for hotel use. The sheets are changed much more often than you do it at home, and the elastic becomes worn out all too soon. Besides, it's a nightmare to store fitted sheets. They have to be of two different sizes, one for either type of bed. It's just easier to take two universal flat sheets per double bed and get on with it. Speaking of sheets, you must have noticed that bed linen and towels in hotels are almost always white. The first reason is convenience, of course. When everything is white, it's easy to wash it all together and use bleach to get rid of any possible stains. The second explanation, however, is customer experience. According to public polls, people perceive a white color as luxurious and fresh, which makes their stay more pleasant. If you see an unusually attractive wow. price for a room on a website, be careful. It might not include a mandatory resort fee. If you have an option to pay for a room in advance, you'll see the final cost at the checkout. It'll normally list the initial price you saw before booking and all the extra charges, resort fee included. If you decide to pay at the hotel, though, you might be up for a surprise when you check out. So always make sure to read the fine print. You may have seen a rather weird thing in many hotels, a phone in the bathroom, especially just next to the toilet. You'd probably be surprised to know that it's an actual requirement for hotels to receive a four diamond rating from AAA. But this also makes pretty good sense. For example, if you slip and fall on the wet floor of the bathroom, a phone can be handy to call for help. Returning to bathrooms, hotels typically don't provide plungers in rooms. You see, hotels want you to have a feeling that you're the first person ever to enter the room you're staying in. It's a question of your comfort, which is the primary concern of any respectable hotel. And a plunger in the bathroom, according to anonymous polls, makes people think that the toilet may malfunction at some point, which doesn't help the image. If your hotel has card keys with magnetic strips, make sure you put your card key apart from your cell phone and wallet. The problem is that key cards are rewritten quite a lot, and they're designed for that process to be quick and easy. So a fairly strong magnet, like the one in your cell phone, could erase your key card, and you wouldn't be able to get inside your room. The hotel will surely provide you with a new card, but that's still inconvenient. Many hotels only accept credit cards as a form of payment, and without one, you won't be able to book a room directly or use the paid services provided by the place. Booking a room is just the first step of your stay at a hotel. During your vacation or business trip, you might use the mini bar or other paid services that you'll only have to pay for at the checkout. If your debit card doesn't have enough funds on it to cover all your expenses, the hotel has no means to get their money apart from suing you. If you pay with a credit card, however, all the additional costs go to the bank, and everyone's happy. The time of check-in and check-out is fixed not to annoy you. It's done so you don't barge in onto guests who stayed in the room you've booked, and the hotel staff can clean the room and prepare it for the next guest's arrival. By the way, the check-out time is normally about 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. because hotels actually care about your well-being. They not only let you have your breakfast, but also give you some time to prepare for departure without hurry. Isn't it kinda annoying that many hotels don't have a socket near the bed? In fact, time is to blame in this case. Lots of hotels around the world were built before mobile phones and other portable devices became so popular and widespread. Back then, of course, they didn't need bedside sockets, and many of them haven't yet caught up with the times. You can avoid this issue if you stay at a hotel that's been built relatively recently. Once you're at the check-in desk, 
it's likely that the hotel staff already recognize you. Many hotels, especially higher-end ones, will do a little research of their guests' social media. While this seems a bit creepy, it's only so they can see who you are to make your stay more comfortable. At check-in, you'll also be given an initial key which will reset the door lock and cancel any existing keys. But make sure to be respectful to your receptionists. Sometimes, they may play practical jokes on rude customers by key bombing. This is where they give you two of the initial keys. Either key resets the door, so once you use the second one, the first will no longer work. Toothpaste is one item you probably won't find in the hotel room's bathroom. For budget hotels, it's often too expensive to order, as it's classified as a medical supply. For luxury hotels, it's the opposite. They often can't find a toothpaste manufacturer that's fancy enough to be present in their rooms. While the staff clean hotel rooms frequently, disinfecting smaller items is not on the top of their priority list. Remote controls and phones are some of the dirtiest things in a hotel room. So do yourself a favor and bring some disinfectant wipes to clean them before use. If you're thinking about putting your valuables in the safe for security, you may also want to think twice. Hotel locks use passcodes instead of locks, so there's a high chance someone in the hotel will know the master code. And who knows who else could get their hands on this information? Hotels usually overbook themselves, as the average daily no-show rate is around 10%. This means there's a chance that you won't actually get your reserved room. If you show up and there are no available rooms, chances are you'll get walked. This basically means the hotel will pay for a room at another similar hotel in the area. There's a surprising amount of items left in rooms that hotels don't want you to know about. In one hotel in Portugal, a worker even found a shark that was left behind. With no idea how it ended up there, the shark was eventually returned to its natural habitat, safe and sound. Most, if not all, hotels have fully carpeted floors, and there's a couple of very good reasons for that. First of all, it's your safety. You're far less likely to slip and fall on a carpet than on a wooden or tiled floor. Secondly, it's much more cost-effective because it's faster and cheaper to replace a spoiled carpet than change the whole flooring in a room. And finally, carpets add to the room's soundproofing, which you'll be thankful for if you have overly active neighbors. Ever wondered what a continental breakfast is and why it's called that? In fact, the name comes from the UK, which is a group of islands, and it means a breakfast that's served in continental Europe. It may include pastries, sliced bread with different toppings, meat, cheese, fruit juice, and hot beverages. Many airports have carpets at their gate areas. This nicety usually comes with a few other perks. Lower ceilings, comfortable seats, and pleasant natural lighting. All this costs more for airports, and carpets are not so easy to clean as hard floors are. But they create a cozy feeling for passengers waiting for their flight, making them more relaxed. Still, it isn't a gesture of goodwill on the part of airports. According to social research, calm passengers are about 7-10% to more likely to go window shopping and actually buy something in the lounge area or duty-free zone. So, by investing in the passenger's comfort, airports actually increase their own income. If you ever wanted to know what happened to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't actually know once it leaves their territory, and they probably really don't care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it. So if your luggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your luggage to the wrong country. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared. These kitchens usually cook food for different airlines at once. And since that oh-so-delightful airplane food must be cooked for about 6 to 10 hours in advance, these kitchens have to work 24-7. And however surprising it might sound, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. 
This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, one airline managed to save $40,000 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. Airport staff sometimes ask passengers to rub their hands on a piece of cloth before putting it into a special machine. It might seem kind of scary, but it's actually harmless. You're simply being checked by a machine called an atomizer. Before their working day starts, employees put samples of dangerous chemicals into the machine. The machine memorizes these smells, and in case a person's hand smells like those chemicals, it alerts airport staff to this danger. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to the security checkpoint, and suddenly, it turns out you have something prohibited to take on board in your carry-on. But don't worry. All the things seized during the pre-flight inspection can be stored at the airport for as long as three months. On top of that, you have an opportunity to mail them any address inside the country. Things taken away by security and weren't claimed can also get sold at special auctions and are delivered worldwide. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. In multi-terminal airports, search for underground passageways connecting terminals that most people might not know about. For example, at Frankfurt Airport in Germany, there's a walking tunnel between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2 that's mostly used by employees since passengers are simply unaware of its existence. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you clear check-in. The golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Let's admit, sitting in front of a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. And that's exactly what the airports want you to feel. If your flight is overbooked and you can't fly at the designated time, don't hurry to accept the first voucher you're offered as an apology. Normally, airlines keep raising the stakes until they have enough volunteers to give up their flight seats. And if they don't and you've been bumped in voluntarily, you can insist on a cash refund instead. Depending on your ticket price and the time of your delay, you might be entitled to as much as $1,300. Most airports have specific experts called profilers. These people practice what's called SPOT, or the Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They carefully analyze facial expressions, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice the nonverbal signs of anxiety, such as people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in a weird or off way, they can invite them for an inspection, where they can talk to a person to find out more about them. Profilers work in both the main halls and in passport control. The typical question they ask is, what's the purpose of your visit? Then they check the person's reaction to this inquiry. No matter how reserved a passenger is, if they have something to hide, TSA officers will find out, thanks to the tiniest cues in people's behavior. Before your luggage even gets on the plane, it goes through five security levels, and one of them, besides scanning the contents, includes being checked by a special dog that can sniff out dangerous chemicals. It's a well-known fact that a dog's nose is much stronger than that of any human. In fact, dogs distinguish smells from 10,000 to 100,000 times better than people do. No wonder airports take advantage of this super sense for security and regularly use these sniffer dogs to detect suspicious substances. What's really cool is that you can't even distinguish a detection dog from its civilian siblings. Unlike police dogs, the ones working at airports aren't trained to frighten or intimidate people. The most popular sniffer breeds are Golden Retrievers, Labs, and German Short-Haired Pointers. Charging your phone at a specifically designated spot can look convenient, but it's not really safe. If the charging station only allows you to plug in your cord, you might get malware installed on your phone with you none the wiser. The only safe way to charge your phone or tablet is to find an electric socket and use it with your own charger. Same goes for free airport Wi-Fi. Apart from the airports requiring you to authenticate yourself more often than not, 
someone can easily access your data while you're using an unprotected Wi-Fi hotspot. It's safer to use your mobile data. But if you absolutely have to use the airport's Wi-Fi, best clear or encrypt all your important data on your device. It might be exasperating to take your laptop out of your carry-on at the security check every single time. But the airport staff need to have a clear look at your device to make sure nothing is concealed inside. On the screen of an x-ray scanner, a laptop looks like a semi-transparent object with a clearly visible hard drive, CD drive, and whatnot. But security officers can't see what's behind some of those parts. For example, a dense and rather large battery. People tend to choose the closest security line to them. If that line turns out to be super crowded, just look around after ID and ticket check. You may see another checkpoint with much fewer people. Some checkpoints at the airport are situated at the far edges of the terminal, and that's why passengers fail to notice them. Applying for a TSA pre-check can be a great time saver for traveling in and out of the U.S. Being a member of this program has some great perks. First, getting through security and passport control happens faster. If you're a pre-check traveler, you won't have to take off your shoes or remove your belt. And forget about placing your stuff like liquids and laptops in special bins. If you aren't flying to or from the U.S., then you can look up similar services available in your country. If you're flying economy class but don't like it, who does? Check in online and check out the seating options about four days before your flight. It's about that time that airlines typically start upgrading seats, and you might get an upgrade to business class for a small fee or even sometimes for free. You can also ask for an upgrade when you're already at the airport. Most people forget about this opportunity or simply don't care, so you might just get lucky. Hey, we all want to get from point A to point B in the quickest, most direct path possible. Agreed? Good. But if you ever wondered why there's no direct flight from your hometown to your destination, there's a reason. When deciding on a new route, airlines have smart analysts who decide what that route will be or if it'll even happen. They got two main questions to answer. How many people want to go there and how much money are passengers willing to pay? Depending on those two factors, airlines can make new routes and drop existing ones. Distance means fuel, and fuel means money. If they're not selling enough tickets to enough passengers going that route, out it goes. So it's not only us passengers wanting to get from A to B the fastest way possible. The airline wants to make it as efficient as it can be, too. Because time is money. By the way, it's always bugged me why people don't want to fly from B to A. It's always A to B. Why? B's a nice place, but you wouldn't want to live there? I don't get it. Anyway, back to the script. Whenever you're going on a road trip, you probably plan your route. You pick the best possible roads, you check how many gas stations, stores, and rest stops will be on the way. Even if you don't do that, airlines certainly do. Because flying is a lot more expensive than driving. Before a flight starts, the crew makes a flight plan. The plan is uploaded to the aircraft's computer and shows the whole route from one city to another. The plane will have to stick to it most of the time, even though there's actually a whole set of routing possibilities. Because it's good to have a plan B, C, and D when you're moving a large chunk of metal through the sky with hundreds of people on board, Airlines have the main route and backups to use in case of weather conditions or other possible issues. So, the people and the airline want the plane to fly the least time possible. As we know, the shortest way from A to B is a straight line. But when you look at the flight map, it's anything but a straight line. It's more of a rainbow shape across the globe. Why is that? Because showing our 3D Earth on a 2D map tricks your eye. Your plane really is flying in a straight line. Proof? If you take a string and connect, say, LA and Tokyo, you'll see it's as straight as lines get. But compare your string to the lines of latitude running across your globe. There it is, that rainbow. If we look at a live flight tracker, we can see thousands of planes flying at the same time in the same route. I mean, the whole map is covered. Look at them all. Okay. Now, let's take, for example, the U.S. and Europe. Planes from New York, Boston, Chicago, and plenty of other cities all fly to Germany, Spain, Greece, you name it. They're all in the same air at the same time and landing in Europe by morning. 
Turns out, the air highway is much busier than anyone thought. Imagine it happening on a highway on the ground. So much traffic every single day. But when you're up there in the sky, looking out at the clouds, it feels like your plane is all alone. All these planes use pretty much the same route because it's faster and cheaper. So how is it that thousands of aircraft all basically on the same road don't fly into each other? Well, the difference between the road and the sky is that the road is flat. Up there, thousands of feet above the ground, the space is 3D. So air travel takes perfect advantage of that. But you still have to coordinate all that movement, of course. Air traffic is managed by dispatchers who watch for planes and make sure they don't get closer than 3 miles to each other. Something that helps them do that is flight level regulations. All westbound flights stay at even-numbered altitudes. 34,000, 36,000 feet, you get it. All eastbound flights are at odd-numbered altitudes. 35,000 and 37,000 feet. Meaning there's at least 1,000 feet between planes flying towards each other. Doesn't sound like much when we're talking altitudes of tens of thousands of feet. But that's about the height of the Empire State Building. Some parts of the air have extremely high traffic because so many planes fly there every minute. Whenever an aircraft enters one of these super busy zones, it must follow a very specific route. But even in not-so-crowded zones, there are still thousands of planes. To share the sky safely, each must follow their own route that even has a specific name. And they have plenty of help staying on the right path. There are devices on the ground called fixed navigational aids, or nav aids for short. They send radio signals in the sky that an aircraft can pick up on. You also have waypoints that are simply geographical points on Earth. They're loaded into the GPS systems, and an aircraft must follow them. An airplane's whole route is basically flying from one waypoint to another, all the way to the destination place. Now, let's go back to that global flight tracker. Something else you'll notice is that planes mostly avoid flying over the ocean in large bodies of water, the Pacific Ocean in particular. Yes, you see some here and there because people do have to get to Hawaii somehow. But in general, everyone's flying around the Pacific, not over it. That's because it's a route that's preferably avoided. Whenever there's a nice path above the ground an aircraft can follow instead, it'll go for the ground. But that doesn't make any sense because flights over water are smoother. Turbulence is caused from hot air rising from the ground. When there's no ground below you in just vast water, the source disappears and you get a less bumpy fly. Still, flying over land is safer. It just comes down to more possibilities for emergency landing on the ground rather than, well, in the middle of the ocean. And planes that take those transoceanic flights are usually the big kind with four engines. It'd just be too dangerous for the ones with only two engines. Just imagine an engine fails, and that plane would have to rely on the one other engine it has. If possible, just best avoid it. But big ones also prefer to have a safe place to land just in case. Now, show me an airport in the Pacific Ocean. Not many of them, huh? Hence, why everyone's flying around it. Another region that planes prefer to avoid is the Himalayas. Again, doesn't mean it never happens, just better not to. The Himalayan mountains are higher than 20,000 feet, with Mount Everest reaching 29,032 feet, just to be precise. Most planes fly at about 30,000 feet, and that's just way too close for comfort. Not to mention the winds are strong there, and mountains make it difficult to maneuver the aircraft that, and there are almost no radar services in the Himalayas, so the pilot wouldn't be able to communicate with the ground. Also, an emergency landing is only possible on a flat surface. The Himalayan region is the exact opposite of that. Add to that, there's a risk of running out of oxygen in this already dangerous area. An airplane only has enough oxygen to last 20 minutes. Plenty of time for the pilot to lower to at least 10,000 feet to a safer altitude with more oxygen. But the Himalayas make that pretty much impossible because, well, mountains, hooking up all over the place. You get the picture. Back to our flight tracker map. You'll also notice hardly any planes flying over the poles, except that one up in the Arctic. Hey, what are you doing there? Ah, Dubai, Seattle. Well, it's one of the very few. 
This route likely got a special approval, navigation system, and a unique set of preparations. The problem here is that the poles interfere with the navigation. Compasses there go berserk and are of no use. The Earth's North Pole has a very strong magnetic field that's constantly changing. The magnetic field moves, making true north different from what pilots see on their devices. If they're just a few degrees off course, it could end up costing them dearly over long distances. That's why very few planes actually fly over the Arctic. And forget about Antarctica, nobody's flying over it. Not that you're not allowed, it's just that almost 70% of Earth's land is in the Northern Hemisphere, and nearly 90% of the world population lives up there. Hey, the more you know. It seems strange that a commercial jet doesn't have keys to turn it on. But it's a bit more complicated than just turning a key. Instead, there's a series of buttons and dials on the control board that starts the complicated process. A battery provides the power to the aircraft that is charged through a small electric generator within the jet's tail. Airflow gets in and moves into the jet's engines to keep them cool. A reserve power then warms the turbines by turning them slowly until they start spinning at the right rate. Then, the engines can be turned on one at a time. With up to four engines on a commercial jet, this entire process can take up to 90 minutes. Planes don't have keys to lock the doors either. But when they sit idle, jets have security guards constantly monitoring them. But even if someone happened to get past them, it wouldn't be a quick getaway. When you enter the plane, the captain keeps a close eye on the boarding process. They are not only in command of the flight deck, but also of the passenger's cabin. To become a commercial pilot, you gotta have a distance vision of at least 20-20. But depending on the airline, it's sometimes okay if your perfect vision is assisted with glasses. It's time to find a seat on the plane. You checked in late, and you've already had an unpleasant experience of not getting on your flight like that in the past. This is because airlines purposely overbook their flights, just in case there are no-shows or cancellations. So, you didn't get to choose your seat this time. You walk past the front seats in jealousy. There are seats that are always taken much faster because everyone wants to leave the plane as soon as possible after it lands. But if you're choosing safety over early departure, the back is the place to be. It's estimated to be 40% safer in the rear end of the plane. Maybe you'd prefer to drive instead of flying? The chances of something dangerous happening to a plane during a flight are 1 in 11 million. Compare it to the likelihood of a car accident, which is 1 in 5,000. You've been placed at the emergency exit. Excellent! More legroom! Over the past 30 years, legroom has been decreasing more with every year. Up to 5 inches on some airlines. No, you haven't been getting taller. The reason behind this is the more people they're able to fit in, the more money the airline makes. Airlines don't build their own aircraft and use factory-made planes. From there, each airline will determine its own seating structure. This is also why the seats don't line up with the windows. But it doesn't matter, you have the best seat, although it's always a bit concerning when sitting next to an emergency door. What if you accidentally knocked it while asleep and opened it? Relax, it's actually impossible to open these doors while flying. The air pressure inside pushes against every square inch of the cabin. On the door itself, this pressure equates to 1,000 pounds across every square foot of the door. But even if you somehow developed Hulk-like strength in your sleep, you still wouldn't be able to open it as there's a series of electrical and mechanical devices that latch it closed. The extra measures are important as the moment the door opens, the entire cabin temperature would quickly drop, and that drastic change in pressure would weaken the plane's structure. It's time for takeoff, and they've asked you to turn your phone off. Should you really? 10% of people have admitted that they don't turn theirs off and don't even set them to airplane mode. Cell phones can cause issues, but they don't disrupt the electronics as you might believe. There is a genuine concern that while you're flying in the air, your phone can receive signals from multiple towers on the ground, providing stronger distractions for the pilots. So let's make their job a little easier and turn it off. The plane has reached 40,000 feet, your ears have popped, and the seatbelt sign is turned off. The flight attendant walks down the aisle with their arms held outward. 
Within such a thin passage, they walk this way as it helps with their balance. They try to avoid disrupting passengers, so they don't use the headrest of the seats. And in case of sudden turbulence, there are special grabbing spots under the overhead luggage bay. It's estimated that half a million people are flying in the sky at any given time. So right now, you're part of that special group involving 0.1% of the world's population. You look out the window and notice the white wings. Planes are painted white and other lighter colors as well to help reflect solar radiation. This avoids damage from the sun by reducing the amount of heat the plane receives. But further in the distance, dark clouds approach and the plane is heading towards a thunderstorm. Since it's made of metal, it has to be a big electric conductor, right? Thankfully, jets are fitted with an aluminum shell that conducts electricity very well. The cabin's interior is completely shielded from lightning, protecting electrical systems and leaving us carbon-based mammals unhurt. A plane is so perfectly built for electrical storms that it's one of the safest places to be. There haven't been any major incidents from a storm since the 1960s. You're thirsty and you're aware that you should have brought your own water. When aircrafts land at each location, they refill their water supplies. The water quality in a plane is based on where they collected the vital liquid. Many things contribute to the water quality of every airport. Water cabinets, trucks, carts, and hoses all could be of different standards. In 2019, an airline water study found that most airlines weren't providing clean water, so the general recommendation is to only drink water from a sealed bottle and avoid even tea but the food is perfectly fine. As you sit back down, you notice the cabin is cold. Super cold, to be honest. It's intentionally set to around 71 degrees Fahrenheit for a good reason. When people become vulnerable to fainting, it's due to not receiving enough oxygen. And when there's warm air mixed with high cabin pressure, fainting becomes more common. So, while the cold air is helping those who need it, you've been provided with a blanket for your comfort. Warmed up with a blanket, you notice the dry air running through your nose, and it dehydrates your lips and eyes. But don't worry, the air is completely safe and very clean. 40% of the air is recycled and goes through a thorough cleaning system to remove all dust and airborne bacteria, and the other 60% comes from the outside. The humidity levels in the air get very low, and that's why you feel all that discomfort. It's now dark outside as the plane begins its descent to land and the lights are dimmed. The dimmed lights aren't for the pilots or crew or those at the airport, they're for you. If something goes wrong while landing when it's dark, they'll have to start an emergency procedure. The dimmed lights are there to help your eyes adjust and help you follow towards the exit in the dark easier. But luckily, today, it won't be necessary as your journey has come to an end. If you're going on vacation, I'm sure you forgot to pack a couple of useful items, like a crayon or a pillowcase. I have collected the best travel tips for your ultimate vacation. You should carefully think about when you are planning to go somewhere. In case you have some kind of flexibility, just forget about going on a trip in July. You don't need to travel during the busy season. It's too expensive and there are way too many people. The best time to travel is during the shoulder season, which is between the high and low seasons. In Greece, for example, it's April and May in September, October. The weather is already or still great, but there are fewer people and the accommodation is way cheaper. When searching for flights, always do it in incognito mode. If you do it in the regular mode, the saved cookie files will track your searches and cheaper flights will be less likely to pop up since you've been searching for a while. Don't give yourself away. Always go incognito. Another trick is to pick a different home country and currency, the one with a better exchange rate. This way you can buy tickets in different currencies that will be way cheaper. Next, when buying the ticket, make a flyer account, no matter the airline you travel with. Airlines gift you miles, and when enough, you can get a free flight. Even if you travel with different airlines, there is no need to miss out on an opportunity. And yes, don't dispose of your plane ticket after the trip until you saw that your miles were posted on your flyer account. Also, if you ever need to cancel a non-refundable ticket, just don't cancel it and don't show up. In case something happens and the flight gets cancelled, you will get your money back because no one knew you weren't going to fly anyways. As for picking the seats, if you fly with someone, don't pick the seats next to each other. 
Keep the middle seat between you, and there will be a higher probability that it won't be booked unless the plane is full. If you're lucky, you'll have three seats for the two of you. But if you end up getting a neighbor, you can just ask them to switch seats with you so that one of you can sit next to each other with whoever you're traveling with. Most people will be happy to switch. If you have a long layover, use it to your advantage. Six hours layovers aren't cool. Too long to chill in the airport, but too short to get out. In this case, better opt for longer layovers and use them to explore the city before your next flight. If you're booking a hotel, always join their loyalty program. Just like with plane tickets, it won't hurt, but you will still be treated like a special guest. Also, when checking in, ask for an opportunity for an upgrade. You can get a better room for the same price and always make sure to let the hotel know if there's any special occasion. Like a honeymoon, anniversary, birthday, or anything, you'll probably end up with some nice perks from the hotel staff. Even though websites for hotel search are cool to use, once you pick the hotel, just call them directly for booking. Websites take fees for posting offers, so everything that appears there will be more expensive. Call the hotel directly to book a room, and you'll get it for cheaper. But don't feel limited by hotels. Airbnbs are a great option, and often you can get luxurious places for cheap. Also, if you don't mind hostels, they can be fun too. You can meet and befriend travelers from other countries, and maybe you can even stay at their place if you ever go to their country. Now off to packing. First off, Always make a packing checklist and keep it on your phone. It's hard to remember everything you need right away, so put together the list in a couple of days and add another item as soon as you remember it. This way, you don't forget anything important when packing. To fit more stuff in your suitcase, roll your clothes. This way, they take way less space. Roll all the shampoos and other things that can spill over in a shower cap. This way, even if something explodes, everything inside will still be protected. Also, use packing cubes. They help to organize everything and save a lot of space. Learn to organize your stuff efficiently. A tic-tac box can be a good storage for bobby pins, and they'll all be in place. Use a carbine to keep all hair ties together. Have you packed a pillowcase? You should. It doesn't take much space, but in case you get uncomfortable when traveling, you can just stock the pillowcase with some clothes. Voila! You got yourself a pillow. Also, put a dryer sheet inside your suitcase. This way your clothes will smell nice, even on long trips. Don't forget to make a copy of your passport and carry it in your wallet just in case. And you can also have a scanned copy of it on the cloud. Another good item to keep is a power bank. Those outlets in airports and airplanes don't always work. Also, get a crayon. It'll be handy if you need to write something down. Pens don't work well in planes because of the air pressure, and pencils break. A crayon will always be there for you. Also, a clothespin is another little thing you might want to have. You know when you arrive and want to keep your toothbrush from touching any counters? If you attach the pin to it, it can serve as a stand. Another little but useful thing is a bread clip. Those serve so many purposes. You can use it as a bookmark, attach it to the end of the tape roll, or keep in place your rolled cords in. But most importantly, they are a must for your flip-flops. The V-shaped part often comes out through it. To avoid it, just slip the bread clip underneath the bottom. It'll serve as a plug stopper, and your flip-flops will last. What to wear? Of course, comfort is the first priority. Sweatpants and leggings are way more comfortable than jeans. A comfy jacket will ensure you don't get cold. A fringe scarf is nice to have too. They're fancy, and they turn into a cover. Also, make sure you're wearing compression socks. They will spare you from feeling swollen during the trip. Another important part of your outfit could be noise-canceling headphones. They will be a game-changer if there happens to be a screaming little human on the plane. And an ultimate trick, mark your luggage as fragile, even if there's nothing fragile in there. This way, it'll be treated better and your luggage will come out in the first batch after the flight. Most people either sleep or surf their phones while traveling, but some travelers can even play board games. But if you need to roll a dice, here comes a problem. If you roll it not carefully enough, you might end up either losing it or crawling under the seats looking for it, which is inconvenient. Just keep the dice in a little transparent plastic container, then shake the container and see what you got. To find cool places to visit, go on social media, check out photos and videos people post from your location, and go to any place that caught your attention. Pickpockets are definitely a thing, but there is a trick. Just make your valuables less attractive to them. Do you have an expensive camera? Put some tape on it as if you fixed it, and the pickpockets will think that it's broken. Do the same with your phone and laptops and whatever else you don't want to be stolen. 
Have you ever ended up with a bunch of foreign coins after your trip that are totally useless? Some coins and bills are cool to keep from trips as souvenirs, but too much is too bothersome. To avoid it, just donate your leftover coins before you leave the country. A good deed and also less weight in your pockets on your way home. Are the letters SSSS on your boarding pass a reason to worry? What's much more dangerous than turbulence? Should you really be the first to board the plane? You're about to figure it out. You might have noticed that most planes have blue seats. There's no mystery here. Airlines opt for this color because it's considered to have a calming effect. This color supposedly puts passengers at ease and helps even the most nervous flyers to relax. But there's also another, more practical reason. Stains, dirt, and scrapes are less visible on dark blue fabric. Never throw your boarding pass away in a public place. It contains tons of your sensitive information, including your name and frequent flyer number. This, in turn, may allow someone else to check your future bookings, change your seat, or even cancel your flights. So the best way to deal with the boarding pass for a flight you've already boarded is to take it home and feed it through a paper shredder. By the way, if you ever see the letters SSSS or S on your boarding pass, get ready for additional security checks. Instead of these letters, there may be a checkerboard pattern. Anyway, if you have any of these marks, your carry-on luggage can also undergo a thorough inspection. Why might they choose you for secondary screening? Some of the criteria are making a one-way reservation or paying cash for your ticket. In some cases, the selection is absolutely random. Look, your gate is open and the boarding is started. Wait, where are you running? There's no need to hurry. The trick experienced globetrotters use is always board last. For one thing, you don't have to waste time standing in line. Then, there are fewer people on the jetway and in the aisle, and you spend less time on the plane. No one is going to take your seat anyway. There's one exception though. If you have a bulky carry-on bag, it may make more sense not to board last. Otherwise, the chances are high that all the overhead bin space will be occupied by the time you reach your seat. And then your bag may end up in another part of the plane, and you'll have to wait till the other passengers disembark before you get to your luggage. Duh! Before takeoff and landing, flight attendants usually flip a small switch on the bathroom door. This prevents it from flying open when it's not supposed to. With the same ease, a flight attendant can open the door when someone is inside. Look, they only need to lift the lavatory sign and move the knob into the unlocked position. Pilots don't worry about turbulence. That's because they know that there is a thing way more dangerous than any turbulence. It's an updraft. In most cases, turbulence only drops you a couple of feet down, even though it might feel as if you're falling from the top of the Empire State Building. If the turbulence is strong enough for the pilots to ask flight attendants to sit down, the plane can go 10 to 20 feet down. The most extreme white-knuckle turbulence is super rare. But an updraft is a big air mass, part of a storm or some other weather phenomenon, moving upwards. Pilots don't see updrafts on their radars at night, and when a plane hits one, it feels like driving over a huge speed bump at 500 miles per hour. An updraft is also extremely treacherous because it can push an aircraft upward to dangerous altitudes. Modern planes have a special system that detects other aircraft, mountains, and different solid objects in their path. Ten miles away from another plane, and a voice in the cockpit starts chanting, Traffic! Traffic! Five miles closer, and the same voice begins to give pilots the directions. Airplanes can operate with one engine, even during takeoff and landing. Both engines failing simultaneously is almost unheard of. But even then, a plane wouldn't drop from the sky like a rock. Pilots would have up to 20 minutes to find a suitable place to land. The way the cabin is pressurized has a great effect on your taste buds. You lose up to 30% of your ability to taste sweet and salty things. In other words, it's not that airplane food isn't tasty, you just don't feel its flavor. That's also the main reason why airline catering companies add extra salt and spices to the dishes they cook. 
but you know what may help you? Noise-canceling earphones. For some reason, that probably has a scientific explanation. Cutting off all that noise around can help your taste buds. Each of those dings you hear during the flight has its own meaning. In most airlines, a Boeing soon after takeoff indicates that the landing gear is getting retracted. Three dings in a row means more urgency than just one. A high-low ringtone informs crew members that their colleague needs them in another part of the plane. Three low chimes means some serious turbulence ahead. Crew members are supposed to put away meal carts, take their seats, and fasten their seatbelts. If you're a nervous flyer, pick a seat in the middle of the cabin. Turbulence mostly affects the front and rear parts of the cabin. The middle section, which is over the wings, doesn't shake so much. Pilots and co-pilots eat different meals. The reason for this precaution is very simple. Imagine both pilots having the same dish and getting food poisoning. In this case, neither of them will be able to control the plane. If they still want to have the same dish and won't agree to have anything else, there's a safety net. Pilots don't have their meals at the same time. If one pilot ate the dish and still feels okay several hours later, the other pilot can brave their meal as well. What would you say when asked about the filthiest place on a plane? Nope, that's not the toilet seat. It's not even in the bathroom. Flight attendants warn that you should be particularly careful with headrests, seat pockets, tray tables, and seat belts. Experiments have shown that one-third of all seat belts have yeast and mold on them. Most tray tables are covered with bacteria. Seat pockets are extremely filthy too, but headrests are the dirtiest of them all. In most cases, flight attendants don't have enough time to change or disinfect them in between flights. If your captain announces they're finishing some paperwork, it means they're busy revising the flight itinerary or waiting for the ground staff to prepare the flight logbook. That's a journal that contains the official record of a journey. Some places, especially those flying long distances, have secret bedrooms for crew members to catch them shut-eye. These bedrooms, called crew rest compartments, are located either at the back of the plane or behind the cockpit. Such a compartment can have up to 10 comfortable beds where flight attendants can have a rest. Plane windows are made of super strong plexiglass that can easily cope with high speeds. And the window panes are shaped in a special way so that the high pressure inside the cabin pushes them against the aircraft body. In other words, plane windows are very unlikely to get broken. Once upon a time, plane windows were square but the pressure built up in the corners of such windows, making them ultimate weak spots. This means that each square window had four weak spots. This made them likely to crash under the enormous stress of high altitudes. Luckily, making airplane windows curved solved this problem once and forever. Such a shape distributes the pressure and reduces the likelihood of cracks or any other damage. Planes regularly get struck by lightning at least once a year or once per 1,000 hours of flight time. These days, it's totally safe. The electric charge simply runs through the aircraft's aluminum shell. It doesn't cause the plane any damage. But did you know that airplanes not only get hit by lightning, but they also trigger it? When an aircraft is flying through a cloud, the friction between its fuselage and the air creates static electricity. Sometimes, it can cause lightning. Hmm? Hey, you've got the wrong person. I'm just a manager going back home from my annual vacation in Europe. The TSA agent pulls out a massive chunk of delicious French cheese from your hand luggage. Turns out, you can only grab really small amounts of soft cheese on board, since it's considered to be liquid. Fun fact, you can bring a cheese grater on board without any problems, but you can grate no more than 3.4 ounces. That's the maximum cheese amount. Wait, you can't grate it. Cheese should be safely sealed in a plastic bag. Good news, hard cheese is fine to travel with. Okay, they took your cheese. A large bottle of water, you're bad. Some cream tubes and other fancy souvenirs. Look at that fine Swiss knife you grabbed in Geneva. It now risks ending up in an auction. If you're lucky enough, 
the airport might provide a shipping service to get your precious souvenirs and even cheese, if it doesn't go bad, to your home for a fee. Still, not all the airports do this. So, some of the banned items will go to an auction to raise money. The confiscated items are usually sold in bulks, so it's going to be pretty hard to find the ones that you had to leave behind. Some other objects with more specific purposes are donated to different organizations. Uh, pepper spray, for instance, would go to a police training academy. As for cheese, prohibited exotic fruits, and other food and water, well, they usually just get disposed of. Some items, especially really bad and dangerous ones, may be simply melted or destroyed. Magic 8 balls pose no danger, but they have to be checked in luggage. The problem is the liquid inside them. Yeah, it might be less than 3.4 ounces, but let's face it, it's hard to count the exact amount. Ask your ball if you can take it on board. It's likely to give you a don't count on it answer. Relieving gel insoles are a bit disturbing on board. The problem is the same. It's impossible to count the exact amount of liquid. So no gel insoles and no gel candles either. Perfume and nail polish are kind of forbidden too. It's not only about liquid on board restrictions, but also about etiquette rules. Some passengers may simply be allergic to their smell. Plus, they're flammable. As for nail polish removers, opt for an acetone-free version, since acetone is a no-go for hand luggage. Anyway, you can grab a bottle of perfume as long as it's not too large and you don't use it on board. It would be a pity to leave a whole bottle in the trash bin before boarding. Still, you can sneak in the plane with more than 3.4 ounces of your favorite cream claiming it's some medicine that you really need. But you do need to notify the airport beforehand. A bit weird, but it works. Sometimes. In case you need to check your body temperature on board, make sure your thermometer is electronic. Mercury ones are strictly forbidden. Who's going to pick up all the mercury balls if you accidentally drop it? Bowling pins are a no-go for hand luggage. Seems like the air crew doesn't want anyone to have fun and play bowling in the aisles during a long and boring flight. No, it's all about our safety. They just think bowling pins might hurt someone. No sports equipment is allowed, be it a fencing foil, a bat, or even darts. Darts are sharp, and no sharp objects are allowed on board. Such items should travel in check-in luggage, unless you want them to end up in an auction. If you're into handmade things, and a transatlantic flight gives you enough time to knit a scar for a pair of socks, opt for plastic or wooden knitting needles and wrap them carefully so as not to cause any damage. Those made of metal will probably be disposed of by melting, and they don't deserve such a fate. Snow globes, as with any other object containing liquid inside, aren't allowed through security. If your snow globe is as small as a tennis ball, you may be lucky to have it allowed, but it's better to play it safe and check the snow globe in. Liquid bleach is definitely a weird object for hand luggage, even if you're traveling in a white shirt. First, it's not allowed on board because it's highly flammable. Second, a brand new white shirt doesn't seem to be the right choice for a flight. <laughs> Coffee and turbulence just don't mix. Third, the bathroom on board is far too small for laundering. If you're a hairdresser on a business trip, you'll probably have to invest a bit more when booking your flight. No hair bleach is allowed on board. Scissors aren't welcome either, unless their blades are 4 inches or shorter. By the way, scissors that aren't allowed to fly are often donated to schools, which is a good alternative to disposing them. Bad news for hairdressers again. Due to a gas cartridge that's filled with butane, cordless curling irons aren't allowed on board. Good news, electric curling irons are completely fine and safe. If you're an artist, you must have already struggled with security rules. You don't want your paint to get frozen or ruined in the luggage section, so you'll surely want to bring it on board. Security may be okay with your oil paints, as long as they're under 3.4 ounces, but there's no way you can grab your extremely flammable turpentine. Now, in case you don't enjoy food on a plane and failed to order a meal on board beforehand, you can take any pan or pot on board and cook it yourself. No, you can't cook, and you can't grab a cast iron pan either. They're quite heavy, that's why they're likely to be dangerous. If a TSA agent confiscates it, it won't end up being donated to a local kitchen. It'll probably be melted. If you want to have some fresh smoothies while flying with fresh fruit that are allowed on board, like an apple or a banana, bad news for you. Blenders are allowed only in case you remove the blades, so technically it's not a blender anymore. Hey, here's when you need that cheese grater. English Christmas crackers can make a wonderful atmosphere of joy and happiness during Christmas holidays, but it brings nothing but a mess on board. 
It makes a cracking sound when pulled, which can frighten other passengers. They are not allowed in checked bags, just like party poppers and sparklers. High heels and thick soles aren't prohibited, but they do cause some problems. If you're wearing one of these, you may be asked to take them off to have them scanned. Sure, there are some plastic shoe covers, but ugh, these airport floors are swarming with germs. Wedding dresses are a bit of a problem, too. Some dresses just don't fit in the x-ray machine, so they might need to be double-checked. All the fans of camping, beware. You probably want to check in a lot of luggage required for your trip, so make sure you check in the tent pegs, too. Though, if you travel light with a carry-on backpack only, you'll probably need to buy some when you reach your destination. Since they're sharp objects, tent pegs are not allowed on board. It's hard to imagine anyone having a drill inside their five-pound carry-on luggage. But anyways, these are not allowed. So if you're a creative person who wants to bring a drill home as a vacation souvenir because magnets are lame, you'll have to check it in. If you want to sneak in a plane with a dry ice DIY fridge, you're almost sure to fail. It's flammable, so safety regulations definitely prohibit it on board. You can bring up to 5.5 pounds of dry ice, but airline permission is required. Anything with an uncovered blade is not allowed through security. Instead, a disposable razor or cartridge blades can be taken on board. Box cutters and knives, with a teeny tiny exception of a smooth butter knife, should be in checked luggage. Soap bars are allowed on board, but don't panic if a TSA agent wants to double check your bag after scanning it. It just may look a bit odd on the screen and mislead them. Liquid soap, instead, follows the universal liquid rule. Rules for batteries may vary. Spillable batteries are allowed neither in carry-on nor in checked luggage. And lithium batteries also can't be carried on board, only because if damaged, they can cause a fire. Okay, you travel with your Mr. Scratchy. And yes, a laser pointer is your furry friend's favorite toy. But you gotta make do without it this time, buddy. Laser pointers are not allowed in carry-on nor in checked luggage. A walking stick can be used as a mobility device and then let on board. But surprisingly, TSA may prohibit this item sometimes. Play it safe and notify your airline in advance. Bon voyage! That little yellow hook you can see from the airplane's window if you're sitting next to the wing is there to help you in case of an emergency landing. Inflatable slides can only be deployed from the emergency exit doors in the front and the tail of the plane. In the middle, the passengers would have to walk right out on the wing and get to the ground from there. But jumping from the plane wing isn't safe because it's just too high. And here's where those little yellow hooks come in handy. The flight attendants tie ropes from the doors and through the loops for the passengers to hold on to. This way, everyone can safely get to the ground without injuries. Now, you want to try to avoid cozying up under airplane blankets. Some airlines only wash them about once a month. Better use your own travel blanket, a scarf, or a jacket. And always remember to wear your shoes while walking around the plane. That carpet on the floor can't and won't be cleaned to perfection between flights. It's just too much time and effort for the cabin crew. The dirtiest place on a plane isn't the bathroom. It's your tray table. It has 8 times more bacteria than an onboard toilet flush button. Now, in case of emergency, oxygen masks only have enough airflow to last for about 15 minutes. Luckily, it's just the amount of time a plane needs to find a suitable landing place or to at least descend to the altitude where people won't need oxygen masks anymore. You may wonder why you're asked to lift your seat back and close your tray table before takeoff and landing, but it's for your own safety. A reclined seat is comfy for you, but it makes it harder for the passenger behind you to get out of their seat, which is crucial in case of an emergency. The lower tray table is the same way, only this time it's you who won't be able to stand up fast enough if anything happens. Besides, the tray table prevents you from assuming the secure position in the event of an emergency landing. This position requires you to bend over in your seat, put your head between your knees, and cover the back of your head with your hands. Imagine doing that while your tray table is open. If you look around the cabin, you'll notice little black or red triangles around the midsection of the plane. These stickers let the flight attendants know where the airplane wings are located so they can immediately look out the right window to see if something is amiss outside. 
you shouldn't lower the window shades while taking off, taxiing, or landing for two reasons. First, the flight attendants must always be able to monitor the situation outside, and open shades help them with that, obviously. Second, if something's gone wrong on board the plane while it's on the ground, for example, a fire, the ground crews won't be able to see it and evaluate the situation before going in unless the windows are open. That tiny hole you see at the bottom of any airplane window isn't there to scare you nuts. In fact, it helps keep the pressure from the inside and the outside of the window equalized. The hole itself is only made in the second layer of glass, and there are three of them overall, which also helps with security, by the way. Even if the outer glass breaks, there will still be two more to keep you safe. Now, you might see flight attendants touching the overhead compartments while they're walking along the aisle, but that's not exactly what they do. Right beneath the compartments, there's usually a handrail that goes all the way through the cabin. So you can also use this trick to stay firmer on your feet in the aisle. The pilots dim the lights in the cabin during nighttime not for you to get cozy and sleepy. Our eyes have a hard time adjusting to darkness in the first few minutes of sudden lights out. And in the case of emergency, every second matters. So the lights get dimmed to let you get used to darkness in case something happens and you have to act fast. Pay attention to the aisle floor, too. If there's an emergency landing at night, there will be two luminescent strips along the aisle showing you the way to the exit. Follow them to get safely out of the plane. Flight attendants also suggest counting the seats between you and the emergency exit once you're seated. This will help you navigate in case there's no other guidance available. If a lightning bolt hits the plane, the passengers won't feel it. The entire aircraft is covered with aluminum coating that conducts electrical current and doesn't let it inside. This protection is tested using a lightning simulator. Airplane windows are round because the air pressure is evenly distributed this way. If the plane's windows were square, strong air currents would accumulate in the corners of the windows, depressurizing the cabin. And that's bad. Don't think you become untouchable if you go to the airplane toilet. The bathroom door can be opened from the outside. There's usually a small latch at the top of the door that allows cabin crew to get you out of there. It's useful for both getting to people doing something suspicious in the bathroom and helping those who don't feel well and, for example, collapsed while in the toilet. Yeah, let's avoid doing that. The plane's wings flash red and green lights at night to show the direction the plane is heading in. A green light is always on the right wing, and a red one is on the left. Aircraft tires are designed to withstand 4 to 5 times more pressure than they actually experience upon landing. The wheel is more likely to break than the tire. Pilots always have different meals. This is necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. The flight can still go well if one of the pilots has gone down because of a stale burrito, but not if it's both of them. And try not to both of you eat the fish. Some airlines don't allow pilots to have beards. Facial hair can prevent securely fitting the oxygen mask. And pilots must always remain conscious. The seats are blue in most aircraft because this color soothes people. It's also easy to keep clean. The rumbling noise you hear after boarding the plane is luggage being loaded on the plane. The compartment is right beneath the cabin, so it can sound quite loud sometimes. On most flights longer than 7 or 8 hours, pilots have access to a specially designed rest seat in or near the cockpit. Flight attendants typically have a section of the cabin reserved for them, and it's sometimes separated from the passenger areas. Some larger aircraft even feature private crew quarters above or below the main cabin. The wings of most passenger aircraft are located at the bottom of the plane. It's called a low wing. Firstly, if you install the engine under low wings, it'll be closer to the ground and easier to repair. Secondly, the wings will take on part of the shock in case of a hard landing. And if the plane falls into the water, then the wings become a life-saving pillow. By the way, a plane can stay afloat for 10 minutes to 60 hours. 
It all depends on the model of the plane, weather conditions, and pilot skills. Now, most airplanes are white because this color best reflects the sun rays and the aircraft body doesn't heat up as much. Also, the damage is best seen on white, and white paint is simply cheaper. Shoulder straps seem more secure than just a waist belt, but not in the case of planes. When the plane gets into turbulence, it's tossed a bit in the air. The waist belt will simply hold you in place in case of a more severe shake. Shoulder straps would require more space between the seats, and this is not justified on a plane. In a car, the impact is usually much stronger, so you need that shoulder strap not to whoosh through the windshield. Flight attendant seats do have passenger straps, but that's because they are much less comfortable than passenger ones. They're narrower and positioned facing the passengers. Flight attendants need extra protection simply not to fall off their seats if the plane shakes hard enough. Also, they have to help and direct people during potential evacuation. And for that, they need to be in top shape. Now, maybe you've noticed that you always enter the plane from its left side. Firstly, the captain usually sits on that side. This way, it's easier for the captain to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with the baggage on the right side. If passengers come from the left, the crew can do their job undisturbed. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared for different airlines at once. Since those oh-so-delightful airplane meals must be cooked about 6 to 10 hours prior to the flight, the kitchens have to work 24-7. Besides, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, American Airlines managed to save $40,000 per year in 1987 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you check in, the golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Sitting in a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. If you ever wanted to know what happens to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't know once it leaves their territory. And they probably don't really care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it! So, if your baggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight. Or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your baggage to the wrong country. You arrive at the airport, already anticipating a couple weeks away from work and all your daily troubles. Park your car in the lot and then find out that it's going to cost you a small fortune to leave your car there. Why so much? In fact, airport parking lots are a business just like any other. The land on which they're built, the construction of the lot itself, the maintenance of the whole thing once it's already in operation, all that costs a handsome amount of money. And somebody's got to pay for it, of course. In addition, parking right next to an airport is simply convenient, which adds to the final cost. If you're not ready to dip into your pocket for a piece of extra comfort, better take a cab. Contrails 
those white trails airplanes often leave behind them at high altitudes are easily mistaken for engine exhaust. But most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. If it's already humid up there, then there's more water and the contrail is more prominent. And if it's cold, the droplets might turn into ice, staying behind for a much longer time. If someone were able to open the door mid-flight, they would be immediately pulled out of the plane by a sudden change in air pressure. It could also do serious harm to the aircraft. Fortunately, that's almost impossible. The doors on an airliner open inward while the cabin pressure pushes them out from the inside. The difference between internal and external pressure makes it impossible for the door to open. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down. The main reason is so that the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. Another reason for all the shades to stay up when the airplane is about to take off or land is for the ground crew to see if there's any trouble on board. For example, if there's a fire in the cabin, the ground crew will immediately notice it and act accordingly. If the shades are down, they might lose precious time they would need to rescue the passengers and the airplane crew. Ever notice the numbers on the end of the runway? They're actually used to show the pilot which direction the plane is facing. For example, the number 36 is short for a heading of 360 degrees, or due north. Along with numbers, the letters R and L indicate if the nearest runway is to the right or left. Every commercial airplane you've been on has only one wing. That's right, the left and right wings are actually two parts of a single wing. The first airplanes were called biplanes because they had two wings, one on the top and the other going through the bottom of the fuselage. They were connected with struts and wires, which made a kind of box that basically allowed the aircraft not to fall apart in the air. It was necessary at lower speeds that early planes could only muster. But as the engines increased in power, the second wing became redundant. The single wing still serves as a support for the whole structure, though. Looking out the window on the plane's wing, you can see a small yellow double hook on it. It seems strange since it might mess with aerodynamics, but it's there for your safety. In case of an emergency landing, these hooks are used to secure ropes that help passengers exit the plane via the wings. If they're slippery, the rope will help you keep your footing and not fall over while going down. There are several extremely fast streams of air high up in the atmosphere of our planet. Their paths are meandering, but they have a more or less constant flow, allowing passenger aircraft to use them. When an airplane comes close to a jet stream, it may adjust to the direction of its current and fly a lot faster, propelled by the flow. Many airlines use this to their advantage to cut the fuel costs and make air traveling even faster. Clouds, especially thunderheads, can indicate that an area of turbulence is ahead. But sometimes, clear air turbulence occurs when a plane can drop a few feet and start shaking without any warning. It happens when two bodies of air clash at very high speeds. And it's absolutely invisible, so the pilots can't tell when it would happen. The chances of getting into an area of clear air turbulence are higher at low altitudes, over mountain ranges, and near the jet streams. Normally, after it's hit by lightning, an airplane is sent for inspection right after landing, but it can still safely complete its current flight. The fuselage conducts electricity well enough, and like with a lightning rod, the zap will most probably strike one of the tips of the airplane, either one of the wings or the nose. Then it seeks the ground, but doesn't find it, exiting from the tail in the end. It's easier for electricity to roll through the surface of the plane than go inside, so people on board are safe from its effects. Still, lightning is powerful, and there can be some damage done to the airplane on the outside. 
Have you ever noticed that one of the flight attendants hides their hands behind their back when you enter the plane? Are they crossing their fingers for a safe takeoff? Nah. At this moment, they're counting the passengers as they board. They have a special little counter for this. There are lots of stories about how bad airplane food is. In fact, it's not that bad. It's your sense of taste that's on the fritz because of the dry air. It dries your mouth out of all its saliva and dulls your sense of smell, which helps to feel 80% of what you taste. So airline companies add more spices into the food so you can feel the taste. Seatbelts are located on the stomach because of the turbulence. When that happens, the plane sort of jumps up and down. Your waist belt holds you so that you don't crash into the ceiling of the aircraft. The shoulder seat belts in the car protect against horizontal collisions. By the way, flight attendants also have shoulder seat belts. It's because they always sit facing the passengers to keep order. While all passengers are flying face forward, the cabin crew sits backward. If the plane goes forward sharply, passengers get pushed into seats and the flight attendants are held by shoulder and waist belts. Even if lightning strikes a plane, the passengers won't feel it. The entire aircraft is covered with an aluminum layer that conducts electric current without passing it inside the plane. Good thing. And all electronics and fuel tanks are equipped with additional protection. Before any plane is released from the factory, all this protection is tested by simulating lightning. Many passengers get a headache during the flight, especially right after takeoff. This happens because you're getting up to an altitude higher than Mount Everest in about 10 minutes. The air up there is thin. Your brain gets less oxygen. By the way, chewing gum or candies can help. Now, the main reason why the seats on the plane are so uncomfortable is profit. Airlines want to make more money, so they try to fit as many passengers on the plane as possible. Because of this, there's so little space between the seats. Two additional rows in the cabin provide 12 new passengers. Also, companies make airplane seats lighter to spend less fuel. Seats become smaller and less comfortable. You can feel cold inside a plane, but when the plane is flying at high altitudes, the conditions resemble those in the Sahara Desert. It's all because of very low humidity. Every hour of flight, your body loses a lot of liquid. Stay hydrated, but only choose bottled water. Many companies don't show movies because they can make passengers too sad or emotional. Even if a movie doesn't have a dramatic story with incredible characters, it can still be heartbreaking for passengers. The thing is that our body experiences stress, and we take everything close to heart because of the lower oxygen levels. Also, we're sitting in seats at a high altitude and very far from home. Our brain realizes we're out of control of the situation. This feeling of helplessness can throw a person's emotions out of whack. So, companies only show positive movies and comedies. Some passengers say they feel like they can't think straight during the flight. This happens because of a lack of oxygen. So, your mind isn't in top form. Well, better not do any important tasks or make any important decisions. Your corneas are the one part of your body that doesn't have a blood supply. The only way they get oxygen is from the air. So, worsened eyesight and dry eyes are common problems on airplanes. The best solution here is to take with you eye drops along with gum. That worsened vision is the first reason the crew dims the lights and asks you to open the windows during nighttime takeoffs and landings. Your eyes need to be adjusted to the dimness in case of an emergency. The second reason is the plane crew needs to be able to see out the window. There's a theory that hair grows faster during the flight. Some people notice that little stubble appears on their faces after the flight, even if they shaved a few hours before they got on the plane. Anyway, this theory is not confirmed. Some say the cabin pressure, lower temperature, or even heightened stress levels can accelerate hair growth. If you experience stress and get nervous right after you step on the plane, your best solution can be a little training. Go to the gym or make a set of squats before boarding to prevent stress. Also, a good workout compensates for the hours you spend sitting still. 
Airlines lose and send in the wrong direction several million lost bags a year. Almost half of the lost luggage is lost because of transfer issues. They may not deliver your suitcase just because of lack of time. A plane could fly away before a loader has put your luggage there. When this happens, they might carry these bags to another flight. And when your bag goes to the wrong place, it can be taken by other passengers accidentally. If you want to find your lost luggage quickly, take a photo of it in advance and then show it to the airport workers. You can also buy a special GPS tracker and put it in your suitcase. It works for 6 days, and you can use your phone to locate your luggage wherever it is. Airport staff take unclaimed luggage to a special center. If the owner doesn't show up within 3 months, the things inside the bags will be put up for sale in specialized stores. There, you can find clothes, jewelry, and electronic devices. And of course, it all comes with a big discount. The rumbling noise you hear after boarding is not my stomach. It is luggage being loaded on the plane. The compartment is right under the cabin of the aircraft, so it sounds quite loud. Aircraft tires can withstand pressure 4-5 to five times more than a plane actually gives them during landing. The metal wheel is more likely to break than the tire. Pilots also have different meals. This is necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. The flight can go well even if one of the pilots feels bad because of a stale burrito. If two pilots ate the same burritos, eh, they could lead to problems. Oxygen masks drop down when the air pressure changes. At a certain height, there can be less air in the cabin. To prevent passengers from feeling this, they should put on oxygen masks. When pilots descend to a safe altitude, you can breathe without the mask again. By the way, masks only have oxygen for 15 minutes. This is enough for the pilots to descend to a safe altitude on which passengers can breathe. The wings of most passenger planes are located at the bottom of the plane. It's built this way because of the engine. It should be installed under low wings because it's closer to the ground and easier to repair. Another reason is that the wing should take a big part of the blow during a bad landing. And if the plane falls into the water, then the wings become a life-saving pillow. Fuel tanks installed in the wings are empty after the flight, and it helps to stay on the water too. The wings of cargo planes are located at the top to make it easy to load the cargo since the hull is located very close to the ground. Also, it helps to avoid getting debris into the engines in case when airfields aren't clean. Plus, this wing location has less aerodynamic resistance during the flight. Little triangles on the aircraft walls are special labels for flight attendants. The triangles mark special windows. You can see flashing indicators through these windows. It signals the landing gear is retracted and the flaps are closed. But for ordinary passengers, this is the place with the best view of the wings. Turbulence is a common thing during a flight, but usually it's so insignificant most passengers don't even feel it. Strong turbulence is rare. By the way, turbulence is just hot and cold air affecting a plane. For better understanding, imagine a big balloon people fly on. Remember the flamethrower installed under the ball? It heats up the air and the hot air raises the ball up. So turbulence is the hot air created by nature, and it makes the same thing with a plane that it makes with a balloon. Also, turbulence can occur if the plane gets under the hot air stream left by another plane. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends.